understanding tomorrow today. And if you're a guest with us, I say rejoin because I have been uh, out of the pulpit for the last several weeks on a summer break. In fact, this is my first time to preach here in five weeks. I don't think I've gone that long in quite a while. But uh, before I left, we had begun uh, this study about Bible prophecy. We've begun a study about end times prophecy, not something that uh, a lot of folks talk about in church because, you know, honestly, it's uh, a little controversial in that people have different beliefs and interpretations about what's going to happen. But we began several weeks ago with a message that was an introductory message all about why we need to do everything we can to understand and embrace Bible prophecy, and if for no other reason than the reason that knowing what's going to happen tomorrow should impact how we live today. Somebody should say amen to that. I mean, don't you believe that's true? Knowing what's going to happen tomorrow should impact how we live our lives today. And then the next week, I shared a message that I called MapQuest, and I called it MapQuest because I began right where we are right now in God's prophetic calendar, and I plugged in where we want to be ultimately in that new heaven and that new earth, and we have been trying to see all the things that are going to happen in between. In fact, let me just put that up on the screen and remind you of what I have been sharing with you is what I believe is God's prophetic calendar, the church age. That's where we are right now, the age of grace. This is a time when God has made salvation available to all men everywhere. He's temporarily set aside his dealing with the nation of Israel, and he's offered people like you and me uh, the Bible calls us Gentiles, non-Jews, the opportunity to be a part of his kingdom and a part of his family. This is the church age, the age of grace. It's not going to last forever, though, and, and we'll know when it's over, when the next event on God's prophetic calendar happens, and that's the rapture of the church. That's my belief. The rapture of the church. We talked about that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 several weeks ago. The harpazo, that's the word that is used there, the Greek word for snatching away or catching away that time when... Christ is going to meet believers in the air. They're going to be caught away or snatched away from this world, and we're going to meet Christ in the air. And then after the rapture of the church comes what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. And this is a horrible, horrific time, friends. It's a period of seven years where God literally, the Bible says, is going to pour out his judgment and his wrath on the earth for all unbelief and all rejection and all sin. It's also a time when God's going to give people one last opportunity to be saved, one last opportunity to the Jewish people who rejected Christ to be saved, one last opportunity for all men to be saved. And it's a time, the Bible says, where there are innumerable conversions. Many people come to Christ during this great tribulation, but it's an awful, horrible, horrific time. The great tribulation is going to come to an end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. You read about that in Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. And then when Christ returns, he's going to set up on this earth a kingdom where he's going to rule and reign in perfect peace and perfect justice and perfect righteousness for a thousand years. It's what we call the millennium, the millennial kingdom. And that's the last thing that we talked about before my summer break began. We're going to pick it up there. We are toward the end of God's prophetic calendar. One, uh, one other thing is that along the way we also talked about another event that's going to happen. I believe it's going to be after the rapture of the church, and that is the judgment seat of Christ, when the Bible says that we as believers are going to stand before Christ and give an account for the lives that we lived. Paul calls it the things done while in the body, whether good or bad, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it's a judgment we talked about of evaluation. It's not a judgment of condemnation. It's not a judgment just of celebration. It's a judgment of evaluation, and that makes how we live our lives in this world today so significant. But here we are, coming to the end, and we find ourselves today in Revelation chapter 20. And so if you've got a Bible, I want you to take it, and I want to hear a lot of pages turning. And I'm just going to tell you in advance that we're digging in this morning. This is a serious and a sober subject, and we need to talk about it, and so I hope you came prepared to study. I don't have any anecdotes and funny stories to tell you today because we're going to talk about something that is so very serious. When you get to Revelation chapter 20, I want you to scroll down and find verse 11, and verse 11 through 15 is our primary text. I wish we could do a little bit more review, but we don't have the time. However, let me just remind you that when you get to Revelation chapter 19, just leading up to Revelation chapter 20, when you get to Revelation chapter 19, what you find is the climax of the great tribulation as the Antichrist and his forces gather together 
and the kings of the earth and their forces gather together to do battle, to, to war against each other at the battle of Armageddon. We read about that in Revelation chapter 19. At the climax of the battle of Armageddon, the sky opens and Christ returns. We read about that beginning in verse 11 of chapter 19. Let me just, just listen as I read. This is the return of Christ, the second coming described. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of God were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now I told you earlier that it's my belief that we as Christians will have been raptured seven years prior to this event. And we will be returning with Christ in our transformed bodies as he comes back to this earth to set up his millennial kingdom. We, I believe, are part of the armies of heaven that are described in Revelation 19, 14. Then when we get to Revelation chapter 20, the first three verses describe the reality of that millennial kingdom, that thousand years. Look at those verses. John goes on to, read, uh, to write, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. That thousand years is that millennium, that millennial kingdom. That's what the word millennium literally means, a thousand years. It's that time when Jesus will rule in this, on this earth in perfect peace and perfect justice, and perfect righteousness. And that brings us to our text, or where we are in the study today. But before we look down at verses 11 through 15, there really is something that we need to talk about, and we see it in verses 4 through 6. So read those verses with me. Follow along. John continues, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast, that's the Antichrist, or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, the reason why I wanted to read those verses, and I want you to look up here and pay attention, is because here's something very important. In those verses, John introduces a significant concept or truth about Bible prophecy, and that is the truth that there are two resurrections. In fact, just so I know you got that, everyone say two resurrections. Let me hear it. Thank you. Two resurrections. John says that he looked up and saw several groups of Christians who were ready to reign with Christ during the millennium, the thousand years. Now, the first group, I believe, are people like you and me, again, who were raptured seven years prior, right before the Great Tribulation, who have returned with Christ at his second coming in our resurrected bodies. But John says there's another group of people he saw. He calls them in verse 4, the souls who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. Who are these people he's talking about? Well, these are people who were saved during the Great Tribulation. Remember, I told you, as awful as it is, it's going to be a time where innumerable souls are one to Christ. It's going to be that time when people have that final choice. Am I going to follow Christ or am I going to reject him forever? And many choose to follow him. These are people who were saved during the Great Tribulation, but they were martyred. They were killed. They were murdered. He says specifically beheaded because of their salvation, because of their testimony for Christ. People who were saved but martyred during the Great Tribulation. And this is what John says. He says, I saw them coming to life again. They are part of the first resurrection. He says he sees the spirits of these martyred saints coming to life and receiving their resurrection bodies, and he said they're part of the first resurrection. I want you to listen to me close. Because I don't think this is something that a lot of believers understand. There are two resurrections. The first resurrection in, 
is for every single person. It includes every person who ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, whoever chose Christ to be their Savior. It's the resurrection of everyone who has been saved. The second resurrection is the resurrection, ultimately, of all of the unsaved dead who will be raised again, who will receive resurrection bodies for the purpose of everlasting condemnation. That is the second resurrection. Now, let's talk about this a little bit more. And I want you to listen close because I probably get asked questions about this one thing that I'm about to say more than anything else. When a Christian dies, when your loved one who is a Christian, your mom, your dad, your whoever it might be, when that person died in faith, when you die one day as a Christian, the Bible says that the, the instant you die, the very instant you die, your spirit is going to immediately go into the presence of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 says that when we are away from the body, we are at home with the Lord. Your spirit, your soul, the essence of who you are upon your death is immediately, immediately in the presence of Christ. And the Bible goes on to say, at one day, at God's appointed time, your spirit is going to be reunited with a resurrected body. Now, in the same way, we understand that. I hope you do. But we also need to understand that in the same way, when someone who is not a Christian dies, when someone who is unsaved dies, they, they don't just cease to exist. They're not just here and then gone, and that's the whole story. Their spirit their soul, the essence of who they are, goes to a place called Hades, which is a waiting place for the unsaved dead. Now, it's not hell in the sense that it's not the final hell. It's a waiting place. And Jesus teaches about this, gives us a picture of this in the Gospel of Luke and the 16th chapter when he talks about the rich man and Lazarus. You ought to write down Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, and go back and read that. Because we're told that while this is not the final destination, this is not the final hell, we're told that it's a place of terrible, terrible torment. And those unbelievers in Hades are awaiting what the Bible calls the second resurrection, where they will receive their resurrected bodies and they will face God's eternal, everlasting punishment. Two resurrections, friends. One for the saved, one for the unsaved. Look back at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. That's why John goes on to write these words. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the what? Say it with me. First resurrection. First resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, everybody understand that there's two resurrections? Say yes, even if you don't, so I can move on. There's something else I need to tell you about this first resurrection. And I kind of debated about this because it... It sounds strange, and I don't want it to be more confusing than it needs to be. But at the same time, I'm afraid that if I don't tell you this, you could be reading and studying your Bibles, and you could come across something that could make you really puzzled about this whole thing. The Bible says that the first resurrection is for all of the people who have been saved, for all the saved people. But at the same time, listen to this close, open your mind. The Bible also teaches that this first resurrection does not happen all at the same time. It doesn't happen all at the same time. The first resurrection, is, again, is that description of believers receiving their new bodies, but the truth is we won't receive them all at the same time. How can that be? How can something like that be? Let's, let's, how, how, can, how can everybody experience the same thing but not at the same time? It's not that difficult a concept to think about or to understand if you think about it practically. Let's say that uh, in a month or two that I got a bunch of tickets to a Colts game. Okay, and it's a home game. All their games are at one o'clock, except their evening games this season, all their home games. And so because we are conscientious Christians, we went to church on Saturday night so as not to miss church. Right. Right. And I say <clears throat> no reason for us to all drive separate cars. I got a big car. I'm going to come and pick you up 
and we decide ahead of time that we want to get to the game at a certain time ahead of the start time. So we want to get there like 30 minutes ahead of the start time so we can do whatever we need to do. And I say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick you up. And so at a certain time, in order to meet that timetable, I leave my house, and I pick up one, and then I pick up another, and I pick up another, and I pick up another. And we all arrive at Lucas Oil Stadium at the same time for the same event, but we got in the car to get there at different times along the way. Does that make sense? Any of you ever driven a carpool? Any of you moms ever driven a carpool? Same kind of concept. Well, it's, it, it, that's a little bit of how we can understand the reality that there is this first resurrection, but it doesn't happen all at the same time. In fact, I'll tell you what, let's do. Hold your place. Mark your place there in Revelation chapter 20. I promise we're going to read those verses in a minute. And I want to hear a lot of pages going back to the left, and I want you to find 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, while you're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let me just tell you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is like the chapter in the Bible that tells us everything we ever wanted to know about resurrection truth, okay? Any question you ever had about the resurrection of Christ, resurrection of believers, you can pretty much find the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, when you get there, I want you to find verse 20. Hang in here with me because this is important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, Paul writes and says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, and then it says, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits. Well, the word first fruits is used in the Old Testament to describe how when the Israelites had a harvest, when God's people in the Old Testament had a harvest, they would bring a portion of it to the temple, to the temple storehouse. They would give it to the priest, and the portion they brought and gave was their first fruits, and what it was more than anything else was a sampling of what was to come. Well, that's what Paul says Jesus' resurrection from the dead was. It was the first fruits. It was a sampling of the resurrection that is to come. That makes sense to us. It wasn't the the sum total of the first resurrection. It was just a sample of what was to come. It was the prototype. It was the most important resurrection because everything else hinges on his. But it was a sampling of what was to come. But here's 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 the interesting thing, and this is why I felt like it was important for us to talk about this. Do you know, everybody look up here, do you know that There have been other people who have been raised from the dead. In fact, how many of you remember that when the Gospels tell us that Jesus died on the cross, that there were some miracles that accompanied his death? In in particular, read about them in Matthew chapter 27. The Bible says that the, remember it says the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that now that everyone had access to God. The Bible says that the earth shook like an earthquake. The Bible says stones split. These were miracles that accompanied the death of Christ on the cross because it was such a significant event. But there was something else that happened. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52, write that reference down in your notes. It says, listen to this, the tombs broke open. This is when Jesus died on the cross. The tombs broke open and bodies of many people who had died were raised to life. Now, you know what happened? You know what that was? That was a part of the first resurrection, but it wasn't the sum total of the first resurrection. It was like the first fruits. It was like a sampling of what was to come. Are you tracking with me? Again, everybody say yes, even if you're not. Yeah. The first resurrection. Now, that word resurrection in the Greek of the New Testament is the Greek word anastasis, and it always refers to a physical resurrection of the body. Every single time it's used, it refers to the physical resurrection of the body. I'm going to say this again because I get asked so many questions about it, and just in case you didn't hear me the first time. When a Christian dies, when you die as a Christian, when your loved one who is a Christian dies, the very, the very instant you die, your soul, your spirit, the essence of who you are goes into the presence of Christ, and your body... This is what the Bible says about your body. Your body goes to sleep. That's how the Bible, that's the, the biblical language to describe physical death. That's how it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 20 that we just read. Your soul doesn't go to sleep. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Your spirit goes into the presence of Christ, your soul, but your body goes to sleep. So when Paul says in verse 20, those who have fallen asleep, he's talking about those who have died, those believers who have died, whose bodies are asleep. One day they're going to be raised. Verse 21, we read verse 20, look at verse 21, it says, goes on to say, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of, dead, of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, I want you to look at me at verse 23, the first part, it says, but each in his own turn. Verse 22 says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made what? Alive. And then verse 23 says, but each in his own what? Say it. 
turn, each in his own turn. See, the first resurrection describes the resurrection of all Christians, but it doesn't all happen at the same time. Not everybody gets their resurrected body at the same time. Now, anybody's got a Bible different from my NIV that uses the word order instead of turn? That's really probably the better translation. There's an order for this. It's an interesting word in the original language of the New Testament. It's the Greek word tagma. Tagma. That's the word for turn or the word for order. And literally translated, it means that which has been arranged or things placed in order. Like I called you and said, I'm going to come by and I'm going to pick you up for the Colts game. I'm going to get you at 12 o'clock. I'm going to get you at 12.15. I'm going to get you at, see what I'm saying? Each one in his own order, each one in his own turn. The idea from a military standpoint was soldiers arranged or placed in order, going to battle, for example, in different order. They all have the same destination, but they got there at different times. That's the first resurrection. And the first resurrection includes every saved person who ever lived, but those persons get their resurrection bodies each in their own turn. All right. I hope that made sense because that's important to think about and understand. But you know what? Here's the deal. The first resurrection is not the focus of our time today. So let's take the few minutes we have left and let's talk about that second resurrection and that great white throne judgment. I'm back in Revelation chapter 20 now, and I'm going to finally read our primary text. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep you here long. Resurrection chapter 20. I want you to begin in verse 11 with me and follow along. This is what John sees. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I want to help you understand these words by talking to you about three things. Write this down in your notes. Okay, this is the great white throne judgment, and the first thing I want you to write down is the judgment described. The judgment described. And it's described in verse 11 through the first part of verse 13. But listen to me, look up here. Here's the one thing we need to understand about this great white throne judgment, the description of it from the very beginning. And I hope you see this. Sometimes we don't read with the kind of comprehension that we should. But this, friends, I hope you see, is an absolutely terrifying scene. An absolutely terrifying scene. John sees this great white throne. On the throne is Jesus. I'll tell you why I know that in a minute. And in front of the throne... John says he sees all the dead, great and small. It's called a great white throne because it's greater than all the other thrones we read about in the scriptures because of its significance. It's called a white throne because it's a throne of purity. It's a throne of holiness. It's a throne of justice. And because the verdict that is handed down at this great white throne is absolutely righteous and just. And Jesus is the one who's seated on the throne. Now we think about God the Father and God the Son ruling over this world we think about them you know seated jointly on the throne ruling this world and that's the reality but when it comes to judgment jesus is prominent because the bible tells us over and over again that jesus is the one who judges sinners ultimately there's lots of references in the scripture look at this verse on the screen from acts chapter 10 and verse 42 this is what peter says about jesus he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify note this that he is the one whom god appointed as judge of the living and the dead jesus is prominent on the great white throne of judgment. There's another startling thing about this description, if that's not enough. And we find it in the latter part of verse 20, where John says about this scene, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. How are we to understand that? Well, this is the day, friends, this is the morning for me to tell you some startling things that maybe you never really heard or thought about before. But what John is describing here is nothing less in this scene than the uncreation of the universe. Or in other words, the end of the heavens and the earth as we know them. I want you to think about all that's happened leading up to this. And if you've been a part of this study, you can remember some of these things. First of all, we're taught that the earth has literally been devastated and ravaged. And then in a kind of a 
perverse way reshaped by the judgments of the great tribulation. We studied about them in Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 18 weeks ago. And then after that was over, we're taught that the earth is then completely restored and renovated when Christ returns and he sets up his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. But we're also taught that when the thousand years comes to an end and Satan is released from his captivity, that there's going to be one final time of rebellion on this earth and that will mean that the earth will once again be tainted and corrupted by sin and so it has to be destroyed in anticipation of the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. So as strange as it sounds, what John is describing here is the end of the heavens and the earth, the uncreation of the universe. That's that's what's meant by the phrase, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them, no place for earth and sky any longer. Donald Barnhouse, in his commentary on Revelation, describes it like this. He says, there is to be an end of the material heaven and earth that we know. It is not that they are to be purified or rehabilitated, but that the reverse of creation is to take place. They are to be uncreated. As they came from nothing at the word of God, they are to be sucked back into nothingness by the same word of God. Can you even imagine that? I want you to listen to me. Don't turn here because we don't really have time. But I want to read to you a description from 2 Peter chapter 3 of what that's going to be like. And you're going to recognize portions of this passage. Listen. To what Peter writes. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements, what's he mean by elements? The physical earth will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. There's not going to be a new heaven and a new earth until this heaven and earth are destroyed. And that's what we see here. You see what I mean? This is a terrifying scene. Do you see it? You have this great white throne of judgment. Christ is seated on the throne to judge sinners. All of those who have rejected Christ, John says, both great and small, rich and poor, powerful and insignificant by the world's standards, everyone will be there, but they'll be there in utter nothingness awaiting their condemnation there's one other significant part of the description that he gives here he says that at this scene where there's this judgment that's going to take place that books were opened do you remember that plural books were opened and then he says there was another book opened and he says that's the book of life the books that he talks about are nothing less than the record of every single thought and every single word and every single deed of every unsaved person who has ever lived. And God, who is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent, he is absolutely perfect in every way, keeps absolutely accurate and comprehensive records of every single person's life. The single book, that book of life, is the record of everyone who's ever been saved, everyone who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that's the judgment described. The great white throne, all of the unsaved dead, great and small, utter nothingness, and books, and a book. Right down to the second thing. Because the second thing he talks about is the judgment defined. He doesn't just describe it for us, he defines what it's going to be about. And he does that in the latter part of verse 12 and the latter part of verse 13. I'm going to put those up on the screen so you can just see them easily. Revelation 20, verse 12, what we might call 12b, says the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Verse 13b, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Now I'm going to say it again. God keeps absolutely accurate, comprehensive records of every person's life, all of us. And for those who will one day find themselves standing before the great white throne of judgment... Those records will be their only defense. The only defense that they have for a life lived in separation from God. The only defense they have for a life of separation. The only defense that you will have for a life where you said, 
I don't care about God. Don't talk to me about matters of faith. I don't believe in Jesus. I'm going to do what I want, live my life by my terms, and be in charge. But if that's the reality of your life, then on that day you'll find, on that absolutely terrifying day, you'll find that what's written about your life in the books, no matter how good it might be by human standards, will not be enough to overcome your sin, will not be enough to save you, because along with every good thing written about your life in those books, there will also be a record of every bad thing, every harsh word, every lustful thought, every, every poor attitude, every act of dishonesty. You could go on and on and on. And if that's all you've got, when you stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment, Because at some point in your life, you decided you didn't need the grace of God. You didn't need Jesus to be your advocate. You could go it alone. Then you're going to discover that's the biggest mistake you've made in your life. I was putting this message together. And I came across this thought about this scene that I had not thought about before. I want you to listen as I read what one person wrote about this. To me, one of the saddest aspects of the great white throne judgment is the initial surge of optimism an unbeliever may feel when he stands before Christ. Once the initial shock of standing before Christ is over, when that unbeliever hears that he's going to be judged by his work, he's going to feel encouraged. He's going to think to himself, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not Adolf Hitler either. I'm a pretty good person. I give to people in need. I I walk down the aisle. I made the profession of faith. I was baptized. I go to church. I I, I give to charitable causes. I, I follow the golden rule. I try to live a good life. But that optimism will turn to absolute despair when he realizes what the basis of comparison is going to be. One of the great misconceptions about the judgment is that God compares us to other people when he judges us. We think God grades on the curve. We think as long as we meet some minimum standard, we'll be okay. But the basis God uses to compare us is not other people. It's the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ. And friends, no one measures up to that, no matter how good you are. You can be the most honest, most philanthropic, most kind-hearted, most moral person that ever lived. But on your own, your life won't measure up. Look at these words on the screen from Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. For he has set a day when he will judge, that's God, will judge the world with justice by the man, that's Jesus, he appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. What's that mean? That means that Jesus is the standard, and that means that Jesus is the only way, friends. Do you hear me when I say that? Jesus is the only way of salvation. Your personal faith in Jesus, your individual personal decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus, to surrender your life in faith and trust to Jesus is the only way. Not a faith that you inherited from your parents where you just go through the motions today. Not some religious system that's all about rules and rituals. Personal faith. And trust in Jesus. See, God is a perfect God. That means his character is perfect. That means he is perfectly just. And his justice demands payment for sin. And that's what happened on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. And by his death, he satisfied God's justice for sin. And gave the opportunity for us to have forgiveness. But only if we put our faith and trust in him. And if that's something that you've never done then let me tell you two things you can know for sure. One day you're going to stand before this great white throne in this terrifying scene and what's written in the books about your life is not going to be enough. I want you to write down this third thing. I want you to write down the judgment delivered. We saw it described. We saw it defined. Now we see it delivered. Look back just briefly. At verses 14 and 15 in Revelation chapter 20. Let's just remind ourselves. John says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And verse 15 says, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the truth is, 
I'm not going to talk too much about this because that's the whole topic of next week's message. And we live in a world and a culture today where it's popular to believe in what's called universalism. You know what that is? That's that belief that in the end, it doesn't really matter. Everybody's going to end up in the same place and it's all going to be okay. You know what? Can I tell you from my heart the truth? I wish that were true. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And we're going to talk about this in detail next week. But I just want to remind you of what verse 15 says. Verse 15 says, if your name is not written in the book of life, and there's only one way for that to happen, then this will be your eternal destiny. I want you to do something for me. I want you to just, put, just close your Bible. I want you to put your, your pen and your pa- paper away if you're taking notes. And I want you just to listen as I read this final passage of Scripture. I'm going to read to you from the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read to you from the 10th chapter, and I'm going to begin with verse 21, and I just want you to listen very, very closely. The Hebrew writer says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and has insulted the Spirit of grace? And friends, that's what we do when we reject Christ. When we think, I can make it on my own. I'll be okay on my own. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. And then the final verse of that passage, verse 31, do you know what it says? It says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you see how serious this is? I was talking to my daughter at the first of the week, and she was asking me about the message this weekend because she knew that I was going to be back in the pulpit and we were going to rejoin this study, and I told her it was uh, about the great white throne judgment, and we talked about what that was and how serious and sobering that is. And then, and this is the kind of relationship that she and I have, she asked me this question. She said, Dad, you think you're going to cry? Who wouldn't? Whatever that means for you, we're not all wired the same. You might not shed actual tears. But you know somebody who's not saved? You love somebody who's not a Christian? Maybe they're sitting here with you this morning. Do you feel that burden on your heart? Who wouldn't be moved, absolutely moved? in the deepest sense at the thought of this scene and this destiny and this reality for people who don't accept Christ. It's a hard thing to talk about. It's a hard thing to hear, but it's the truth of the word of God. Who wouldn't be moved? I want you to pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, I am so thankful for the chance to know what's waiting, to know the stakes, to know the reality of eternity when we make the choice to go it on our own. And I hope it moves every single heart that's here. And my prayer my earnest prayer this morning is there's anyone in this service today who's not got the assurance of their salvation who doesn't know for sure today that their life is right with you because they've given their heart to Christ I pray that they would come what could possibly keep them from coming today I pray that they would not worry about the size of the crowd or what anybody might be thinking 
all self-consciousness be put aside and they would just come. I pray, Father, that if there's anyone here today whose heart is absolutely burdened and breaking for a lost loved one, that they would come and they would pray. They would pray for their salvation. They would pray that you would open the door for them somehow at the right moment, at the right time, to share their testimony and what Christ has done for them and what Christ can do in their life. But most of all, I pray that we would just not put it off. We wouldn't wait any longer. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I asked Brian this week if we could sing a song from the past. At least it's a song from my past. I'm sure there are many of you here who know it. And I have vivid memories my whole life growing up in church hearing this song being sung.